A few disclaimers before I get on with today's video. Firstly, as we have seen the title card at the start, today I will be discussing some quite sensitive topics in detail. There is no way for me to talk about this book without mentioning child abuse, as you'll see. So if that is a topic that you're sensitive to, please feel free to skip on this video. Secondly, this is a parenting book intended for parents, guardians, or anyone who is looking after small children. Now, I am obviously not a parent, nor do I wish to be one anytime soon. However, I believe that the contents of the book are so egregious that you don't have to have offspring of your own to know that this is wrong. You just have to be human. This video was partly inspired by Rachel Oates, who made a two-part series on the same topic, which would be linked below. To Train Up a Child is a book written by evangelical Christians Michael and Debbie Pearl and published via their own non-profit organization titled No Greater Joy Ministries. Now, while researching for this video, I found a free PDF version of the entire book on Wayback Machine, so thanks to whoever posted it because I don't want to give any of my hard-earned money to these people. Right off the bat, the book starts off by comparing children to various animals like mules, mice and rats, dogs, horses to justify training them as it reads, a dog can be trained not to touch a tasty morsel laid in front of him. Can't a child be trained not to touch? How does Pearl suggest training in this context, you may ask? Well, through switching and spatting the child, to entice the child, to allure them to this object that is appealing to them, and then spat them immediately with no. Now, for obvious reasons, I am not a fan of this zoomorphic comparison of children. But say, even if hypothetically we take Pearl's word for it, what he is suggesting here is not even suitable for training dogs. Every dog training program on Earth, even the most basic ones, will tell you that positive reinforcement is the best way to train for both the dog and their owner, and pain-based aversive techniques do not work in the long run. It's interesting to note that Pearl provides no sources, no evidence for his findings, if you can even call them that, aside from this Amish family that he interacted with, anecdotes from people he knows, and of course, the Bible. In fact, his justification for the switching is that God does it. God placed the forbidden tree within reach. Pell goes on to call parents who reject his ways of raising children as bad parents, calling their children unlikable because if you spare the rod, you hate your child. He goes on to claim that you probably don't even like your children if you don't follow his teachings. And guess what? If your child turns out to be anything other than ideal, it is all your fault as a parent. This honestly feels like some sort of projection on Pearl's part, his own hatred of children to the point he feels the need to have power over them. That being said, chapter 4, which is titled Tying Strings, is a relatively good chapter. I do want to give it credit where it's due, as Pearl goes on to say how it's important to tie strings with your child, being a friend and understanding each other's needs, although it is still reflecting on Pearl's ideas of traditional, rigid gender roles, it is Pearl that we are talking about. The bar is already low. But aside from that, if I were to read this at any other context, I would take it as solid advice that is helpful for both the parent and the child. But in this book, it just feels like a cheap way out for Pearl, as an excuse to again blame the parents if their children stop talking to them when they're older. Pearl provides an anecdote about this mother who was worried about her 14-year-old daughter, which is honestly depressing to read. While it is quite common for children to grow distant with their parents as they get older and become more independent, and there are various reasons as to why it may happen, but in this case, if you as a parent have implemented the teachings of this book onto your child, it is not difficult to see why. But even in this case, Pearl blames the parents. The strings have already been cut. It's your fault. Throughout the book, Pearl constantly assures the parents that they are training their child. It is for their own good. It is their duty as parents, even accusing them of condemning God, saying that they are raising a German soldier in the 1939 if they don't use the rod. Because guess what? Even most parents don't want to physically hurt their children. But then surprise, in the long run, if the child decides to cut ties with you, it is still your fault. You didn't tie the strings. 
the rest of the book just goes downhill from there, with the next chapter titled simply The Rod. Pearl goes on to classify different sizes of rods to use depending on how old the child is, because a child is never too young to train. Even newborns who may bite when nursing, Pearl suggests you pull their hair, an alternative has to be sold out for bald-headed babies, suggesting to lightly spank and lecture the child if they don't respond to you immediately, admitting to hitting his four-month-old daughter with a foot-long branch from a willow tree when she wouldn't stop climbing the stairs, and of course this stellar paragraph where he says, Never reward delayed obedience by rephrasing the sentence, and unless all else fails, don't drag him to the place of cleansing. Part of his training is to come submissively. However, if you are just beginning to institute training on an already rebellious child who runs from discipline and is too incoherent to listen, then use whatever force is necessary to bring him to bay. If you have to sit on him to spank him, then do not hesitate and hold him there until he is surrendered. Prove that you are bigger, tougher, more patiently enduring and are unmoved by his welling. Defeat him totally, accept no conditions for surrender, no compromise. You are to rule over him as a benevolent sovereign. Your word is final. This is about a child. Who talks like this about anyone, let alone a child or a baby or an infant? Pearl tries to justify it by saying how infants are inherently self-centered, how they learn to manipulate their surroundings as they grow, and how you should never give in to that. Now, I'm not denying that there are spoiled children who have no manners, no considerations of others, but an infant? Like, I can't believe that I'm even saying this, but an infant does not have the mental capacity to comprehend how their actions may affect others. It's not that they are doing it for gratification or because they want attention, it's because they need attention and intricate care for them to survive. I think it's safe to say that this book really isn't about raising children or parenting them or to even build their character. It's about training them, of course, to condition them to be obedient, to be under your submission, to feed into your power trip. I mean, Pearl literally says it's not about punishing the baby, it's about conditioning them. Honestly, I'm not very fond of children, especially in public places. Nothing makes me want to leave more than a child that is screaming their head off. However, I can still understand that kids need a space to express themselves. They aren't able to fully communicate their needs yet, and sometimes that can come off as unpleasant to those around them. Like this young couple Pill talks about with five children, three of them being under five, and the mother is exhausted and doesn't want to have any more children. And of course, to Pearl, not wanting to have children is probably the worst thing you can do. So they make this couple do the switching and all that training drills onto kids, and apparently they went through a whole service at church without a peep. Forcing three children under five to remain quiet for hours at a service? Like, honestly, I would be more concerned if the kids managed to keep quiet than if they were just running around, screaming, knocking things over. Because that's what kids do. Anything other than that cannot be normal and it cannot be mentally or developmentally healthy. And I'll be transparent, I was abused as a child in all sorts of ways. It was my mom who perpetrated most of the abuse, and whenever she would go off at me, I would instinctively run to my dad for support and comfort. And of course, Pearl does not want that. If one parent is spanking you, the other should join in and collectively beat. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant train the child to look with it. A majority of the book is going over these training principles, abusing their children, abusing other people's children, hitting in ways that would not leave a mark, yet be effective. And I don't really want to dwell on this too much and subject them to you because it's quite depressing. And also, it has already been widely covered by the backlash that this book received, which I will get into. But for now, I do want to focus more on the emotional side of things, not just on the children, but on their mother, Debbie, as well. So after the birth of their first child, Debbie suffered from infertility for two years and then she miscarried. Needless to say, Debbie was overtly possessive when she finally had their second child, 
a son, rightfully so. I mean, I'm not very well versed in issues like this, but I do know that you don't just snatch a baby, a rainbow baby for that matter, out of their mother's arms, let alone a mother who has gone through infertility, miscarriage, and probably postnatal depression like they did to Debbie. This group of men at church just took him away with no explanation, and her pain was just laughed at. Like, it's like the opposite of giving birth. She was being winged. Ha! Huh, I have my wife back. Throughout the book, Pearl keeps trying to convince you as to what he is doing is actually good for the children. It is making them happy and cheerful. He even admits that his ways are harsh, yet justifies it by saying how it created warm, friendly, loving, confident, calm, hardworking, loyal children and adults. But how do you really know that when you have forced your kids into submission? How can you truthfully say that your children are content in an environment that forces them to repress their emotions, that sets up rules like a cheerful, compliant spirit is the norm? Anything else is a sign of trouble. Because aside from his words, the examples that Pearl provides that condones or even praises the child are quite disturbing. Say this three-year-old girl who was playing with her dolls. She picked up the switching tactic from her mother, I assume, and was doing the same to her dolls. It is actually quite common for victims of abuse to become abusers themselves and inflict the very same abuse that they themselves were subjected to, and thus the cycle of abuse continues. But Pearl just praises this three-year-old girl, saying that she is already on her way to raise obedient children. Or this child, who was so afraid when she got in trouble, that she pulled her diaper down, gave herself three slaps at the bare bottom so that her parent wouldn't do it to her. That is not cute. I don't think it's even normal. If you think this was bad, wait till he talks about little girls. He interjects by saying how children's dolls should only be baby dolls to role play as mothers, not Barbies as that'll only teach the child to be a sex goddess. Now, let me interject as well and say that, and this may be an unpopular opinion, but I personally don't think that there is anything wrong with Barbies. Obviously, there is the issue of representation and promoting certain beauty standards. But aside from that, Barbie at its core is simply a dress-up game. There are so many careers, so much that you can be as a Barbie, from doctors to astronauts to farmers. It is quite inspiring as it is teaching young girls that they can be whatever they want to be. But of course, Lord forbid if a girl wants to be anything other than a wife or a mother. He continuously applies parentification where he forces his older children to look after the younger ones, especially if they are girls, which is downright abuse. He also goes on to say how socialists have demeaned gender roles, how a boy needs a man to grow up to be masculine, otherwise he will grow up to act more like daughters as if that is a bad thing. And with that, he sort of segues into more general life advice by saying that this is a dog eats dog world as this is how he responds to your child getting bullied. If he is roughed up by his peers, rejoice. He is learning early about the real world. Don't make a sissy out of him. If you jump to his defense every time another child takes away a toy, pushes your child down, or even pops him in the nose, you will rear a social crybaby. When you demand that your child be treated fairly, you are protecting him from reality. The younger they are, the better to learn that they deserve no equality. Your reactions are not going to make life any less unfair for your child, but you can mold a feel-sorry-for-myself attitude. If you are tough, they will be tough. And almost to prove that, he literally tries to push his own child in a pond. Yeah, so he was showing his children the switching tactic, but with a little pond, by letting them nearly drown to understand its danger, and one of the children was hesitant to go in, so he just shoved her. For toilet training a child, he goes up to the father to have a man-to-man -man conversation, and decides that every time the child swallows themselves, they would be cleaned outside with a hose as a punishment until they learn to properly use the toilet, which can't go anything wrong with that, right? One thing that I do somewhat agree with is his approach to fighting or resolving conflict. He goes by a principle that if it's not fun for all, it is not fun at all, which sounds reasonable. I know in my family, I would like everyone to feel included. 
I wouldn't want anyone having fun at someone else's expense. But then again, when it comes to disciplining his child to implement this principle, he says this. Son, you know Hitler and his men had fun when others were suffering. They laughed while boys and girls cried in pain. Do you want to grow up to be like Hitler? This was about popping a balloon. He then goes on a tangent about homeschooling. It should come off as no surprise that he is an advocate for homeschooling. He goes on to calling public schools automation factory, which is quite rich coming from him. And if you're worried about socialization or the lack thereof, he's got you covered. He tells you to just get a TV and watch Hollywood for two hours a day because Hollywood is not for God's children. If you want to destroy your family, then get yourself a good TV and VCR to keep the kids company. The book ends with Michael and Debbie Pearl writing open letters to their sons and daughters respectively. In the letter to his sons, Michael Pearl starts off by saying that the woman that they will marry will be the lifelong mother of their children. Which, right off the bat, is assuming a lot of things. What if they don't want to get married? What if they would rather focus on their career? What if they're gay? What if they don't want children? What if their partner doesn't want children? He then goes on to say how important it is to find a hard-working, creative girl, don't marry a lazy, slothful girl. But of course, those are not to be applied in the real world outside of home, because a wife must be your helpmate. One little positive thing is how he actually acknowledges that a woman might need extra support after childbirth, extra rest to be efficient, but it's funny how he compares a fetus to a tumor, and also the fact that he expects her to bear children every two, three years sounds exhausting. When his son goes on to having their sons, he wants them not to be confined in school. Instead, by the time they're 12 or 13, he wants them involved in a hands-on, real-world occupation. Whilst I do agree that, to some extent, school is quite useless when it comes to teaching you real-life skills, but at 12? And here's the thing. All these structures, specific roles to play in society, like one party deals with things inside the house and the other outside, seems good on paper and can actually work if that is what you want to do. However, the issue arises when they are forcibly enforced. In this case, he is already putting all these structures in place before they are even born. What if they want to stay in school? What if they want to go off to a prestigious university or college rather because it's American? What if they want to get a PhD, be an academic, be a researcher? Can you not do that because it doesn't count as essential training? And of course, when you're still young, you are still to be expected to get your nest ready like any of God's creatures. Just have no life for yourself. Now, the letter from Debbie to their daughters was a lot shorter. Despite being listed as the co-author of this book, Debbie barely made any contributions, which made me think that maybe Michael didn't want her to, which was further reinforced when she says this in her letter. Remember to be a hidden woman. Stand behind your man with prayer, encouragement, and trust. While looking more into Michael and Debbie Pearl, I begin to notice something quite specific. And I don't like to attack on someone's character, let me be clear. But these people are exactly how you'd expect them to be. The stereotype of being aggressively American, the gun-loving, socialist-hating, driving a pickup van, speaking with a thick southern accent, they, they're hillbillies. There we go, I've said it. What are you going to do about it? And I'm sure we've all dealt with people like this at some point in our lives. It's easy to brush them off. I know in my personal experience, I've got family members who lean very much on the right politically, who hold racist, xenophobic, homophobic, and all sorts of bigoted views, who don't agree with my lifestyle or whatever. And at this point, I'm sure a lot of you can relate, I just don't care. I just don't have the energy to entertain their ideas anymore. Whatever they say to me just goes in through one ear and goes out the other. But the difference between the pearls and your uncle who thinks gay people will go to hell or something is that Michael and Debbie Pearl are public figures who probably hold a lot more power and influence than your uncle. Michael and Debbie Pearl's rhetoric is extremely popular among the tight-knit circles of evangelical Christians who would rather homeschool their children than send them to an actual school. The book To Train Up a Child itself has sold over 800,000 copies, 
and are currently still being sold on large platforms like Amazon, Book Depository, and more. Michael and Debbie Pearl are still continuing to write and publish more books promoting their dangerous rhetoric. There are real people with real-life consequences that are being affected by this book. And of course, with such things, there is always someone who will take things a bit too far. Between the years 2006 to 10 alone, this book has been linked to the deaths of at least three children. Lydia Skurs, who was seven years old at the time of her death, was killed after being beaten down for allegedly nine hours by her adoptive parents for mispronouncing a word. 13-year-old Hannah Williams died from hypothermia and malnutrition after being denied food and forced to take garden hose showers outside. Four-year-old Sean Paddock died from suffocation after he was wrapped too tightly with blankets. All three children had one thing in common. Their parents or caregivers were defaulted followers of Pearl and they used the book to train up a child. In response to all these deaths, Michael Pearl pulled your typical it's been taken out of context card and is still continuing to defend his work. He just laughed at his critics and claimed that the deaths of these children is not objectionable because his own children came out fine. They became entrepreneurs that pay the taxes your children will receive in entitlements. While researching for this book, I also came across several testimonials by people whose parents used this book onto them as a child. And obviously, this being testimonials and anecdotes, there is no way for us to ever know if they're fully accurate. However, I still think that they're just as powerful. And if Michael Pearl can write an entire book based off of anecdotes alone, then I can at least provide one. The poster reads, I grew up in a Christian-based cult. My parents used this book. My siblings and I were often beaten with a wooden spoon that my parents had drawn a line on to signify that it was being used when we crossed the line. My sister is now an alcoholic with bipolar narcissistic psychopath. My brother is a manipulative sociopath. And I am a paranoid schizophrenic with severe anxiety. All of us are clinically diagnosed. The way I was brought up has given me severe trust issues and an inability to ever be comfortable with social interaction. It has ruined all three of our lives. Please don't beat your children. Like I said at the start, I'm not a parent and honestly, I don't even like children very much. However, I don't think that should exempt me from having this conversation. Just like how you don't have to be a chef to critic someone's food or be a musician to judge certain types of music or, you know, be well researched enough to write a book. If there are any parents out there who are still watching this, I don't want to leave you empty-handed, so I'll provide some resources down in the description below that you can use. There is this one method of parenting called gentle parenting that has gained popularity over the last few years. Gentle parenting is not what it sounds like. It's not about giving in to your child's demands and being compliant. Rather, it's about being assertive and working with your child instead of working against them. I'll also have some general resources written by, you know, actual professionals instead of some Amish family. If you must spank your child, I would much rather have you use all the resources that you can find, try out a whole range of different ways, and only turn to inflicting physical pain as the last resort. I mean, if your first response, your instinct when dealing with a troubled child is to hit them, then you've got a problem.